As part of um, Christmas uh, and every December, we go into support world missions mode. Jesus came on a mission to rescue the world, and he sent us out on his mission to tell the world that he came. And our missionaries are out preaching the gospel in foreign lands, places way different than America, places way different than South Florida. You say that's everywhere is way different than South Florida. I understand. But friends, I want you to see a three and a half minute video. So it's a little bit longer than usual. But I want you to see our new IMB president, Paul Chitwood, is from Kentucky. And he was the leader of the Kentucky Baptist Convention. And as David Platt felt called to go to a church and has, has resigned from the IMB, Paul Chitwood has become the president of the IMB. And he is a wonderful leader um, for our 4,000 IMB missionaries. So the Lottieman Christmas offering is what we are giving to. I want you to get to know Paul Chitwood in the next couple of minutes, and I want you to notice all these missionaries. So th these videos really show a lot of missionaries in diverse places. The videography is beautiful. I think you'll see that a little bit. But um, I, wanna, I want you to learn this morning about the International Mission Board and IMB missions as we are making that part of our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So your gift to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering keeps those missionaries on the field. The goal is $165 million for Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. So we have a long, just kidding. <laughs> our part of that is $60,000, but it's $165 million for the, for the nation. And so if all 46,000 Southern Baptist churches will come together and we will give sacrificially during the month of December, listen to this, over half of the budget of the IMB is, is met through this offering. So this is a big deal, Sheridan Hills. I want to encourage you to really think about um, how you are going to give. This is the time for a sacrificial gift. Now, I'm going to say to you, we have uh, a bunch of buildings here that are 50 years old. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars of roof work that needs to be done that we don't have the money for yet. And we're going to have to deal with that next year. But I want to say to you that I unhesitatingly put this offering ahead of all of our needs for brick and mortar here at this church. We need to keep our missionaries on the field. Amen. If you do not have a sermon outline, please lift your hand. These kind gentlemen have one for you. I need to just say to some of you uh, that sometimes you don't take a sermon outline, go ahead and at, lift your hand. You need one this morning especially, and you will graduate to a three-pager. Some of you are new to us. You've never experienced a sermon outline with its three pages. Well, this morning you do. There's a staple there. That's not a mistake. Uh, that's on purpose, and you'll see why. We are about to read the glorious Word of God. We are about to look at the majesty of what God has done. And each Sunday when we come together to study his word, we are looking at the words of life. These are the words of the creator. We should give our attention. We should give our full attention and devotion to understand what he is saying to us. And so we've been studying Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 28 through 30, we've had two messages so far from this passage, but notice this, November 10th, a few weeks ago, we looked at, you are citizens of heaven, honor Christ. You remember that? That's it. We were talking about the, the honoring. You'll see that in the passage here, and you'll be reminded of that. And then the very next Sunday, we, in November 17th, we said, stand firm together. Know what? We said, no Lone Ranger Christianity. So part of what he is saying here is, look, you are Christians, people of Philippi. Live like Christians. People want to live like in a worthy way of, way of Rome. Far more than that, live in a worthy way of heaven, of Christ. And then he says, stay united. Stay united together. And this morning, we come to the end of this uh, section, verses 28, 29, and 30. You see in the box on your page, and you see the message title above that says, you and your church expect opposition and joy. Expect opposition and joy. Because this is the picture of Philippians. These people are under pressure. Paul is in prison under pressure, and these people are under pressure in their difficulties and in their trials as people they're seeking to stand for Christ and honor Christ in this present life. 
Notice the screen in front of you. I want you to see the picture of Mehdi Debaj. Mehdi Debaj, an Iranian pastor. Notice this bio a little bit. Mehdi was born in Iran as a Muslim in 1939. So um, 80 years ago, he was born in Iran. He became a believer in Christ in 1973. He was imprisoned by Iranian government in 1984 as a pastor. So he became a Christian, eventually became a pastor, became one who would share Christ with people in the Iranian, um, amidst the Iranian government in the, in the country of Iran. And he was sentenced to death in 1994. He sat on death row for 10 years. And the government wouldn't go ahead and sentence him to death. They wouldn't go ahead and execute him because there was so much pressure from the world and from the United States to not um, violate this human right of being able to believe what you want to believe. And so eventually, under great pressure, they released him from prison, um, from pressure from our State Department, and the next week, he was found murdered in a Tehran City park. But I want you to hear his testimony of the week before he, he died when he um, was, he, there, there was an appeal and he was seeking to be released and they, they, they came out with this. This was his final defense. And I want you to read, I, I want you to see what he said. Jesus Christ, so he stood before the court in Iran and he said, Jesus Christ is our Savior, and he is the Son of God. You understand, those are fighting words for Muslims right there. And he is the Son of God. To know him means to know eternal life. I, a useless sinner, have believed in this beloved person and all his words and miracles recorded in the gospel, and I have committed my life into his hands. Life for me is an opportunity to serve him. And death is a better opportunity to be with Christ. Therefore, I am not only satisfied to be in prison for the honor of his holy name, but I am ready to give my life for the sake of Jesus my Lord. Official transcript of the Iranian court holds that testimony that he gave as his final defense. His final defense was not pleading for his life his final defense was not saying, look, it's really not that bad. I can get along with Muslims. His final defense was not anything except for, I am guilty as charged to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, I converted from Islam to Christianity. He has come and saved me. Christ has come and redeemed me. And I am content to walk in his way. This is the life and the testimony of Mehdi Debash. And uh, this morning, I think that we can take great encouragement from his life as he was living out this call of Philippians. Let's look and review, important review statements that are here, especially if you're new to us this morning. We want this message to make sense to you, and you can kind of see where we've been over the last couple of, um, last couple of weeks. And if you're, uh, if you're usually with us, we know that it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in Philippians. And so notice here with me. Remember, a few weeks ago, we looked at the fact that Paul calls the Philippian believers not to compromise their manner of life in Christ. Notice there at the top of the page where it says in the box, in verse 27, he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Circle the word only. He's saying there's no room to compromise. Honor Christ. This is what we want to see. And so as we study this, let's review. Look at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you underline it, that you are standing firm. You're standing firm in how? In one spirit, with one mind, striving together side by side for the faith of the gospel. And that was our message on unity. Notice the next one here. Number two, he's saying P Paul calls the Philippian believers to live as citizens of heaven 
in Philippi. He's saying live in a manner worthy. You really belong in heaven, but you're still all here on earth. This is why even one of the hymns we sang a few minutes ago referred to us as in exile. We aren't yet home. This isn't our country. Our country is heaven. Our city is heaven. Our final destination is heaven. We are citizens of heaven, but we still live here in Hollywood. We still live here on the earth. And so that's what Paul is saying to them. Only let your conduct be in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ right there in Philippi. Look at number three. Paul calls the Philippian believers to live in true harmony for the gospel's sake. So they need to live in harmony together. They need to get along together. Many churches are divided. Many churches have unity problems. Many of you have seen churches with unity problems. Maybe you've been part of the unity problem, and maybe God's been bringing you out of that. He's been helping you become one who plays nice in the life of church and see the greater value. That's okay. We have all kinds that come here, and so that's, that's great. We are, we are rejoicing in the fact that Paul is saying live in a way of true harmony for the sake of the gospel. Now, that doesn't happen easy. Notice this under number three. This, this is a military term. The term stand firm is hold your ground. This is a battle term, and that's what it takes to remain unified as one. A church has to hold its ground together. We have to be vigilant, and we have to stand in, in opposition to disunity. And um, we see that in this, one spirit, one mind, striving together, end of verse 27, one spirit, one mind, striving together, side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's a military term that we need to apply to our determination to be unified. And look at number four. There are two internal threats to church unity. So if, if we're talking about the subject of unity, there are two internal threats. And letter A is the first one. It's having a lone ranger, independent, how about this word, individualistic mentality. And just put out there to the side, toxic. This is toxic for a true church. And this is a huge problem in America. Our wealth and our individual thinking and all of our conveniences make us where we can live lives very individualistic, not only from our neighbors in our neighborhoods. That's why many of you have no idea who your neighbors are because you don't really need them. You just live next door to them. It's, it's not like, you know, uh, when it rains, you know, there's floods and you got to run to their house for safety sometimes or something like that. I mean, we, we just don't have those problems here, so we don't even know one another. Um, but here we see that, th that this toxic thing of individuality has creeped its way into even the American church, that very often church members don't want to be connected to one another. And I want to say to you, in this church, we're connected. This isn't the church for you if you don't want to be connected. And why? Because this is what God designed. This is what God wants for us. And so that, you know, you say, you say I'm new to all this. And I say, okay, we'll be gentle. We'll bring you along slow, but we just want you to see that there's this beautiful thing called koinonia. There's this beautiful thing called fellowship one, with one another that helps one another, especially as we see opposition come. So two internal threats is the individualistic thing, Lone Ranger thing. And we just said, you know, the Lone Ranger, that show is over. Um, so you, you, you remember Tonto and you, you remember all this. And we say, no, no more. That's done. Not for Christianity. There's no Lone Ranger Christianity. We are called to be together. Letter B is that we must not allow division and strife. And so division and strife often comes from either petty things or major differences or major offenses in the life of the church. And so what we're going to see as we continue to study Philippians and we see all through the New Testament that the church must not allow division and strife to divide it. We are to be of one mind in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the, faith, faith of the gospel. So number four is the internal threats. This morning we come to verse 28, 29, and 30, where we look at the external threat, and we're going to move fast. So look with me in verse 28 right there, and I've made this bold. This is the text that we're studying this, this morning. Look at verse 28. He, so he's just said, stand firm together and look at the next part, and don't be or not frightened. 
We're not to be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign of them for their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Wow. This is, this is God's will for us, that we would believe in him and that we would even suffer for his sake. Verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had. So Paul is saying, he's saying, remember all the conflicts I've had? Remember people against me? Remember the troubles with me? I've had these too, but you engage in this and it's all for the glory of Christ. You know that I've had these troubles and that I still have even now. He's sitting on death row as he writes this. So the next thing that we see is the external threat to the, church uni- to the church unity is opposition from the outside. The outside wants to tear us apart. So the first things are mentioned from the inside. The next ones are mentioned from the outside. Notice number one here with me. Opposition, persecution, and suffering are a reality for godly churches. This is what we see in this text. We need to recognize that opposition, persecution, and suffering are a reality. Now, I have a statement here that's also important, I believe. As I've prayed about this and thought about this, many, many Americans do not know what it means to be in church and to experience opposition. Um, We have had this weird 200, 250-year thing of powerful church life in America with very, very little opposition. This is not normal around the world. You need to understand that most of the world experiences quite a bit of opposition to their gathering together as a church family. There are some places where it's just, it's just kind of nothing, nothing makes it easy. They can do it, but nothing makes it easy. I mean, France is one of those places. It's really, really hard to find a place to meet for a new church in France. Very, very difficult. No one, you know, many of the laws are structured. Many of the other things are structured in such a way that unless you kind of already have it, establishing something new meets great resistance, and you have to work through it. Same thing in Germany, same thing in many areas of Europe, where there's just this kind of a tacit re- resistance. But then you start moving further east from there, and it becomes far more intense, where you can't even have a place in many Central Asian countries. People must meet in their homes because they're not allowed. There's opposition. And then you keep moving east into modern-day China. And while modern-day China, it, it, over the last 20 or 30 years, there was a great movement of Christianity in China. But over the last five years, that grip has been coming down under the president of, of China at this time. He is seeking to squelch the churches that are evangelical churches. Many, many churches have been closed. Many, many leaders have been deported back to wherever they came from if they were missionaries. There is a lot of pressure on the, on the Chinese church. There are key pastors that were arrested last year, and no one has heard from them. There is a lot, there is opposition. This is a reality for most of the world. But Americans haven't really experienced that. Let me just say this, look at what it says. In American experience, we have generally not had true opponents, underline this, until now. They have arrived. And there are various opponents that are showing up on the scene and becoming more and more and more known. We have the Americans united for the separation of church and state. It's not merely about separation of church and state. Their ultimate goal would be for churches not to exist. The American atheists is a very powerful lobbying group that that really mocks and, and absolutely derides anything about faith, especially in the public sector. And they would be very happy if we no longer existed. Most recently, especially with the LGBTQ movement, the human rights campaign has become incredibly hostile to American churches. That, that this is, a, this is a, a lens through which they view all of life, and if you do not agree with them on this, they want to absolutely squelch your, your voice and even squelch your freedoms to meet and to simply say, we don't agree. 
And so this is, this is very, very great hostility. One of the other big ones is Freedom From Religion Foundation. These are very powerful lobbying groups. These are very powerful cultural groups, often based in Marxism and socialism from the 1950s and 60s. That's where they, they really got their strength. And they, they come to seek to limit our ability to worship as freedom, in freedom, as our hearts would dictate. In fact, this last group, they have massive media campaigns that you may see around with billboards, all kinds of things um, that are often uh, shown around the country. Um, in science we trust, imagine no religion, or it's time to quit the church. You see, these are oppositions from the outside. There can be problems on the inside that rise up in a church, but then there's also pressures from the outside. And in the Philippian church, they weren't dealing with billboards in towns against them, but they were dealing with government, and they were dealing with Judaizers, and they were dealing with even just Jewish synagogues that were against who they were and what they were seeking to do. And so we see that there is opposition that comes after the church. And um, I want you to just notice a few things here. The goal of, uh, of worldly opposition is to break up and destroy the church. You see, there's a reason that Jesus said what he said just as he was leaving to return to heaven after dying on the cross and rising again for our sins. As he was leaving and the Holy Spirit was about to come, he said, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I commanded you. And he said this, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says, even to the end of the age, because at the end of the age, it's going to get rough for the church. Jesus, in fact, would look at them and say, look at Peter and say, Peter, upon the rock of your confession and faith in me and me alone, this truth that I am the Christ, upon this rock that I am the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The reason Jesus said that is because we're going to be tempted to think Satan's going to win. It's going to get hard enough, and it's going to get rough enough that we begin to think, where is the Lord? But the Lord has been warning us, and the Lord even uses his own words, and he uses Paul, and he uses Peter, and he uses different pastors and different leaders and different authors through Christian history to remind us that there is always opposition in a fallen world to God's plan. So notice here with me, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, and verse 24 and 25, just as Jesus speaking, and he says this in verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Circle the word hated. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. You're going to be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Look at verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? You say, what does that mean? What is Jesus saying? Jesus is looking at them and saying, look, if they're calling me, the son of God, the devil, just imagine what they're going to call you. I'm the one that does miracles in front of their very eyes. I speak nothing but truth, and I do so perfectly. But they are rejecting that, and I am a threat to them. So they just say, this one is from the devil. And he said, if they're going to do that to me, they're going to do that to you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, and I'd like you to put a big circle all the way around that whole verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12, look what it says. In fact, let's read it out loud together, okay? Let's read it out loud together, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Here we go. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus is making it very clear in his words. Paul is making it very clear to Timothy that there is the reality of suffering. There is the reality of opposition. Now, the amazing thing about this verse is, up here in verse 28, there's the other thing that we can see is, you see there's two things that are given. Bottom of, or bottom of verse 27, he says, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, 
in verse 28, that you're not frightened. So look at verse 28, and that you're not frightened in anything by your opponents. Now, here's the amazing thing. Number two shows us this. Number two says, fear doesn't have to be a reality for godly churches. You don't have to capitulate to fear. And so what he's saying is, is that you don't have to be frightened. And we look at these guys' lives that were alive in this time, and we look all through human history that when there's been opposition, very, very often there has been God-inspired, God-fueled boldness in the midst of opposition and persecution. There are many Christians that think, oh, that would just be the most horrible thing I can think of. It would just be terrible if, if the world came against our church or if the world came against my faith or the world came against my son or my daughter and my son or my daughter was really persecuted. Let me tell you, that's not a happy thing. There's no doubt about it. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is to deny and leave God. The worst thing is to not know God. The worst thing is to call Jesus Beelzebub. That's the worst thing. The worst thing is to not stand with God. I want you to notice this. The, in, in all of the Bible, um, this is one of the places of 145 times that the Bible clearly tells us not to fear man, Satan, or circumstances. There's over 400 references not of, uh, to, the, in some way, touch, or form, uh, refer to fearing, but 145 of them very specifically say, do not fear man, do not fear Satan, do not fear circumstances. And so I just want us to be encouraged that there's only one thing that we should fear. It's God. If you fear God, you don't need to fear anything else. I mean, I don't know where you are about various, various issues in your life, but you know, the fear of man will drive you to do crazy things. The fear of others, the fear of what people will say at work, the fear of family members, the fear of these other things, the, the fear of other people. When, once you begin to recognize that they are not to be feared, that the one to be feared is God, and that everybody else, after we have feared and come to recognize who God is, to honor him and who he is, to learn of his word, to him to come and work within us, he gives us the power to not fear others, but to love others. Even, listen to this, even our enemies. This is why in our resistance, we are to resist in a loving way. We don't need angry Christians shouting down the culture. I'll say it again. We don't need angry Christians shouting down the culture. We're not called to be angry and negative. We're called to be the light that looks and smiles and says, you know what? There's something better there's something a whole lot better. And let me just, let me just share with you with that. I mean, the, the fact that God has called us to not fear man, but to fear him is a beautiful thing. I love 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. I memorized this as a senior in high school when I started to walk with the Lord. Um, look what verse 7 says. For God has not given us a spirit of what? You see, fear doesn't come from God. Write that above there. Fear does not come from God. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but look what it says, but of power and love and of self-control. Or another word for that, self-control, sound mind. Um, sound mind. So when I think I'm losing my senses, when I think I'm losing my mind, I go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, you know, I'm not called to be afraid. God has given me power and love and a sound mind. Look at verse 8. It goes on with this whole theme of, of opposition. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. You see, this is about standing in the midst of opposition. Don't be ashamed of testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Underline that. But share in suffering for the gospel, and then maybe circle the last few words, by the power of God. You see, there's some people that say, well, pastor, this is such a daunting thing for me to think about, that I would be persecuted. I would be persecuted like those who have gone before us. I'm afraid of that. I'm so afraid of that. And I would say, well, look at the verse. The verse is saying, don't be afraid. Instead, 
rely upon God's strength and rely upon God's power in your life. Look at the next part here. Number three, very quickly. You see, our lack of fear, so, so if we're not afraid of their opposition, our lack of fear clearly shows two eternally important things. Letter A, it reveals God's enemies. So when we are not afraid, it reveals who the enemies are, and it reveals to them who God is. See, look what it says in verse 28. It says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. So this is a clear sign that they're in the wrong camp. When you're not afraid and when they have all the power of prison and torture and they have all the power of, of the culture around standing behind them and what they're mandating, and we simply say, well, you can do that, but it's okay. I mean, I, you're not going to change my belief. I am standing with what God has said. I am standing. You can't tell me that he doesn't exist, and you can't tell me that your way is the right way. No, what he says is what is right. It's not me saying it, it's him saying it. And I'm simply standing with him. When we act like that, whether it be in the face of torture or whether it be in the face of just general opposition, we come. And I'm not talking about angry. I'm not talking about proud. I'm not talking about injurious. I am talking about humility and steadfastness in Christ. And there's a big difference. We're not called to be angry. We're called to be steadfast in the truth of God. When we stand in that way, it reveals their wrong. It reveals that they are opposed to God. Look at letter B. It also reveals God's children. So when you stand steadfast with him, it reveals that you're his. So notice those verses together. This is a clear sign for them for their destruction. Look at the next part. But of your salvation. And where does your salvation come from? And that from God. That's what it says right there. So Jesus is speaking, and in John 3, 16 through 21, he really unpacks this. This is beautiful. See if you don't see, but almost in an inverse way, that when we believe on Christ, we don't perish. Whereas those who don't believe upon Christ, they are going to perish. Look at John 3, 16. In verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, this is good news. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The gospel is good news. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Here, third time it's saying it. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe, look what it says, is condemned already. Why? Because they're born into a sinful world that needs salvation. They're born into this world sinful, and they need his salvation. They're already condemned. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Here's the judgment. That light has come into the world. That's Jesus. That's Christmas. That's his teaching. He's born into the world. He lives 33 years. He is sacrificed for us. That light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed." Look at verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes in the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out where? In God. You see, it's God who changes our heart. It's God who causes us to walk in good works. It's not you. This isn't a, salva this isn't a verse talk or a passage talking about our salvation because of our works. The picture is either you are in God or you're not in God. If you're not in God, you're going to love the darkness. You're going to do the things of the darkness. If you're in God, you're going to love the truth. You're going to seek to stand with God in what he says. So the source, fill this in, the source of our boldness and strength is always him. 
You don't have to worry about persecution coming and opposition coming, thinking, oh, I've got to be brave enough, and I've got, otherwise I'm going to be lost. No, the picture is, if you're in Christ, he's going to give you the strength and the boldness to go through the trouble. This is what he does. So we need to turn our fear away and turn our confidence and our faith in him. Stop being afraid and just trust him. Trust him that he knows what he's doing and that he will sustain you. That's what Paul is telling the Philippians. Don't be afraid of them. Trust in him. You're his children. Look at the next part. Our boldness and strength amidst opposition reveal that we are saved by him. That's what this verse says. It says that it, it is for it's been, excuse me, this is clear sign of their destruction, but of your salvation. It's a clear sign. That's what it does. It reveals this. Look at the next bullet point. We are saved by him through belief in him. That's how we're saved by him. That we come to recognize that he died for our sins. We come to recognize that he is the only hope of our salvation. It's not through our boldness. Again, the boldness only comes from him. Satan is so crafty at constantly trying to turn every aspect of walking with God into depending upon us. And then we feel defeated because we can't do it. But when we begin to look at passages like Galatians 2.20, I put that up there under the first bullet point. Galatians 2.20 says, For I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's not me doing it, it's him doing it. Let me relieve you. You're struggling with pornography? Let God overcome your pornography. You're struggling with anger? Let God overcome your anger. You're struggling with undisciplined and all of your spending and your relationships and everything else and all of this? Let God overcome these things. Come to God. Look to God. He is mighty to save. He is mighty to help. This is what this word says over and over and over again. Just come to me in faith and run after me. And as you fall in love with me, God is saying, I will give you the strength to be exactly whom I've called you to be. You were created for good works in Christ Jesus, not in yourself. So come and let him do it. And that applies to dealing with opposition and suffering. We stay at his feet and he gives us what we need. Now very quickly as we close, and this will go fast, number four, two important gifts the first important gift from God that we see in this passage is the privilege to believe in Christ. The privilege to believe in Christ and thus be saved. Look at the italics just under letter A. Look what it says. This is from our passage. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him. So that's the first part, that you would believe in him. It's been granted that you would believe. This is a gift from God. If you believe in Jesus, it's not because you were smart enough or humble enough to, forget, to figure it out and to, to, to accept him on your own. If you believe in him, it was granted for you to believe in him. Salvation is from God. The scripture is so clear about this. Notice the next part here. This is all God's grace. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 8. Usually we quote 8 and 9, but if you go back and read verses 4 through 8, you will see that all of this is for the glory of God. It's all because of what he has done in us. It is his grace. But letter B, not only that we would believe in him, but the strange one is letter B. This is the one we're not so familiar with. This is the one we want to reject. It's not only that we would believe in Christ and be saved, but that the privilege is that we would suffer with Christ and thus bring him glory. You see, we, 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 we're not so excited about that one. Oh, can't wait to go suffer for Jesus. I, listen, I don't feel that way either. I don't look forward to that either. And I don't think anyone does. Nobody that's normal does. Some of you are weird, and so you probably do. And when you do, I kind of think, oh, don't gin it up yourself. Listen, don't, don't, you know, some people think as they are just super bold and super obnoxious and everything else that it's not about being obnoxious. You're going to suffer for that. If I'm going to suffer, I want it to because of, because of faithfulness to what God has said, not because of my own obnoxiousness. And so the picture is this, is that we 
we suffer, and this shows the world who Christ is. This shows the world his goodness. And I really want you to think about the life of Christ. Would there be any salvation without Jesus' suffering? He suffered. Listen, from the start he suffered. He leaves the halls of heaven and becomes a baby. That is humility. Can't even change his own diaper. Becomes a human. And does he become a baby in the palace of Athens or in the palace of Rome? No, he becomes a baby in a horse's stall in this little town called Bethlehem. And he's showing us his humility. And he lives in this life. He grows up going through all of the struggles and the hardships of someone of Israel in the first century. And then when he begins to teach, he is rejected. In fact, the very first day that he goes to preach, they run him out to a cliff and they're going to throw him off the cliff because he says, I'm the Messiah. Today this has come true. I've come to deliver you. And they, they see it as blasphemous from the start. And then three years of that, and eventually they nail him to a cross. Jesus suffered for our salvation. This is the nature. This is, the, this is what happens of, in association with a holy God in a fallen world. There's going to be rejection, but all of this brings God glory. Look at Jesus speaking in John 15. In John 15, he says this. And in fact, in verse 18, he starts and he says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 20, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. Let's read the next part out loud. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours too. Here's the point. Some are going to persecute you and they're going to hate you, and some are going to listen and believe and follow you. So as we go forward, we just know there's sometimes when there's going to be opposition and there's sometimes when there's going to be acceptance, and you don't know who it is. In fact, some of the people who look like they're going to oppose you the most, that they seem to be the furthest from the gospel, are some of the very people that are going to embrace what you're teaching. And some of the people that you think, oh, this guy, these couples so great, they're so wonderful, I like them and everything, and boy, they're just, they're so close to all of this. They, they just already seem like such well-formed, you know, wonderful little American Christian people. And when you really get down to the gospel with them, they go, uh-uh. You're going to tell me it's all about him and not about me? No, no, thanks. Keep your Jesus. Sometimes we'll be surprised at who rejects the gospel, and we'll be surprised at who accepts the gospel, and Jesus is making this point, and this is why we're just called to be faithful. Look at John, or Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus is speaking, and he says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me. You see, friends, you talk about persecution. Jesus is calling you to follow him in persecution. He's saying, take up your cross. What is that? That's the place of execution. Die to yourself and live as unto Christ and follow him. But why? Because that's what he did. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 29 through 30. And this is very personal to me and to Marcy, um, and I'll explain why in just a minute. But look what it says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 29. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, look what it says, verse 30, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. 
Now, there's a lot being said here, and you may need to read this a few times. You may need to read it after you go home, but here's the picture. He's saying that anyone who has had to leave their family to follow Christ, and there's not many Americans that have had to do that. Some in this room have had to, where, where you see that, man, my, my family no longer accepts me because I've become a Christian. I know that that's very alive in this room at different varying degrees of level. But our friends in North Africa, I think about, I mean, like 98% of them, when they followed Christ and were baptized, their family rejected them. Some of their families tried to kill them. In fact, we know people that were killed by their family because they became a Christian. But here, here we see Jesus' general principle, and Jesus' general principle is this. You come to me in this life, and I have ways to repay and to take care of you in ways you cannot imagine. You may have to give up your house. You may have to give up your land. You may have to give up your, you may have to flee to another place. But listen, I have the cattle on a thousand hills. I can take care of you. And that's exactly what he says in verse 30. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Here, here's, here's what I mean by this is personal to us. When Marcy was a teenager, she was in Brazil in a very Roman Catholic family, and she came to faith in Jesus. And as she did, her family had a lot of dysfunctional problems, and her family initially really rejected her. She went to live with the, the missionaries that were leading uh, mission work in that area in her town. And as she got to know them, and, and they said, well, why don't you come and help take care of our children? And so Marcy, as a teenager, went and helped took care of their children. And as time went on, there was more and more and more rejection from her family. Her family said, you're not Catholic anymore. Her family said, you just judge us. Your, her family just came to the place just because she didn't do what they do. She didn't go where they go. She wasn't going with her other brothers and sisters down the road that she was going. And as that happened, there was indeed, she came back home one time. Somebody else had moved into her room. And there was increasing distance between her and her family. But you know what? God has taken care of her. God moved her to a place where there were, there were families that loved her, and she had brothers and sisters that she never knew. And even now she says, boy, we have hundreds of children, Andrew. We our, look at our church and our school. God has given us so much. Friends, I want to say to you that when you come into the family of Christ, you may lose some who reject him, but you're going to gain many who accept him. And this is a beautiful thing. There are many brothers and sisters in Muslim countries that have realized that the family that sustains them in so many different ways is not their biological family, but the family that their soul is connected with through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so Jesus' perspective in all of this, I want you to see, and turn the page with me, and I want you to see this very quickly. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Look what he says. Verse 10, he says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus goes on in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, this is what happens in a fallen world. A fallen world that has embraced sin and that has embraced darkness, when God's light comes streaming in to individual hearts, there is the beauty of those promises and there's the beauty of that redemption, but there's also the resistance to him upon us. And Jesus is saying, hold on, it's gonna be okay. Blessed are you. Look at Paul's perspective on suffering with Christ. And this is in what we're going to study in a few months. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Look what he says in this about suffering. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You see, he was a powerful Pharisee. He knew all kinds of things. He had esteem, and he just let all of that go. He said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. You see, as a Pharisee, he was keeping the law. He knew the law. He, he was getting his power from the law. He said, that's not where my righteousness comes. But that which comes through, underline it, through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends upon faith. You see how thick this is, how clear it is. Look at verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. And so how does he attain the resurrection? How is he saved? How is he attained to that? It's through faith in following Christ and sharing in the sufferings. What about Peter? So we've looked at Jesus, circle Jesus up there at the top, circle Paul's up there, now circle Peter's. Peter's perspective on suffering with Christ. And I want you to notice, this is very interesting. In 1 Peter, you talk about a letter that deals with suffering. Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, and then 1 Peter chapter 2, and then look at the third one, 1 Peter chapter what? 3, 1 Peter chapter 4. And every single one of these chapters we see the issue of suffering bubbling straight up. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, that though now for a little while you may have to had to suffer grief and various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more precious than gold, which perishes even through refined fire, may result in what? Praise, glory, honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's admitting that there's going to be suffering, but there's, it's going to all be repaid. He knows how to do it when he comes back. Look at First Tim, or First Peter chapter 2. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So some servants have good masters, some servants have bad masters. Look at verse 19. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrow when suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, and if you kind of deserve it? Look at verse 20, middle of verse uh, 20. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Look at verse 21. I've underlined it. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow him in his steps. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Now when, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Look at verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Says just what Philippians says, have no fear of them nor be troubled. Friends, Philippians is, is repeating the same things that Jesus has said, the things, same things that Peter is saying. We see Paul saying the same exact beautiful promises. I want you to close in 1, Timothy, or 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16. Look what it says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Now, that's what happens sometimes. Sometimes trouble comes, suffering comes, and people act they're just shocked that there's difficulty, they're shocked that there's resistance, shocked that the world is coming after us. Look what he says. Don't be surprised by that. Look at verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and, and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as a, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, glory, let him glorify God in that name. Amen? Friends, we should not be surprised when suffering comes. We should not be surprised when family members turn. We should not be surprised when our American culture starts to really resist and cause trouble and issues. We just need to be faithful. We need to be faithful to God. Amen? 
Notice the last part. Suffering with or for Christ is a command. We see that. Jesus said, come and take up your cross. It is a command. It's also a blessing. That's counterintuitive to us. We don't think of it as being a blessing, but it's a blessing. And look at the last one. And it is an honor. It is an honor to be so identified with Christ that we will look and rejoice in him. And listen, he honors those who honor him. Amen? Amen. May we receive the teaching of Philippians and be encouraged. Your, you and your church expect opposition and joy. Would you stand with me for prayer?